everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Yosha and I'm your go-to channel for all things real. Today's video is a series of Ask Yosha and the topic is how to save for your first home. This is for you who has the potential to get there but you're gonna have to finance. I had to finance but there's nothing wrong with that. So first thing that you want to do is pick a living situation that's gonna allow you to save. Once I graduated college, I moved back in with my parents. I got a job. I didn't have to pay half as many bills as I pay here, but I did have to pay something. Basically, I was only paying for car insurance, cable bill, internet. When my father got sick for a while, I was pitching in and paying a third of my parents' mortgage. It gave me the responsibility to see how to manage money but it wasn't quite like now where me and my husband are responsible for a mortgage, car insurance, I have a car note, and everything else that you may have in your home. It's harder to save money when you are living on your own. It's not to say that you can't do it, but if you are a millennial, or you're young, you don't really have a lot of money, then I highly recommend looking into an option where you can live with someone else. Don't feel ashamed for having a roommate or two roommates so that you can cut your costs by two or three so that you can really save. Now, you're gonna have to pick something that allows you to build some sort of uh, character on paper because when you do buy your house, they are gonna wanna know where you were before you bought the house. They are gonna verify two to three years of income from you. They are going to use how much you make currently and your work history for the last few years to determine how much that you qualify for if you're doing a loan. If you're trying to move into a home within the next three years, maybe the first year you start with saving $50 a month. The next year you up it to $100 a month. The next year you up it to $200 a month. You know, take baby steps with it and that way you will have a couple thousand saved up by the time you're ready to go. You cannot spend all your extra money while you're living with your parents or while you're living with a roommate or two roommates and only paying a little and expect to be ready when it's time for you to go on your own. But understand that in order to get that 5,000 or that $10,000, if you are saving, you're gonna have to sacrifice some of the fun and the things that are causing you to not save. If you have a certain lifestyle and you wanna maintain it, but you also want the house, you may have to consider like which one is more important to you. I cannot stress this enough. If you are only paying like 600 or less and you're making closer to a thousand, you need to be sacrificing two or 300 out of that. I know that sounds like, oh my gosh, that's a lot, but think about what you're getting done that you're not sacrificing. Are you eating out a lot? Are you getting your nails done a lot? Are you buying bundles? Are you like buying clothes off Amazon, off Boohoo, off Fashion Nova? Where is your extra money going? And is that an essential? Is it important? Is it something that you could do without? Even if you're spending $200 a month and you reduce that to $100 a month, that's $100 more that you could be saving. Pick up some extra streams. What are your talents? What are things that you can do on top of your nine to five to give you extra money? Because I know some people watching this are probably gonna be like, well, the problem is I have a job, but I don't feel like I have enough money to save anything. The key is to have multiple streams. Once you find a full-time job or a full-time supply of income that works for you, from that point, figure out other ways to make money on top of that. So you have money coming from different directions that you can pull from and decide where and how much you're going to save. Honestly, you're going to have to tap into what makes you extra money on the side. What are things that you do? What is your talent? Can you cook? Do you sell plates? Do you do hair? Do you do makeup? You know, do you sell lashes? Do you have an online store? There's so many different things that you can do that are extra on top of what you already do to put food in your mouth. So figure out what that thing is, do it often so that you can start making extra money and put that money into the savings bucket. I recommend doing some sort of affiliate marketing. If you have a blog or a website, you need to start promoting those links in your website on your YouTube channel and that can help to generate some passive income for you. 
how it works is if people click the links that are in your description and they make a purchase, you get a percentage. You could even set it up to your savings account if you wanted to or to that credit union or wherever you wanted to go to where it's not touched. If you have a YouTube channel and you're monetized, you can set your YouTube AdSense account to go to an account that you can't touch. Find some things that you can do online to make money with, whether it be like mystery shopping, online survey taking, like selling pictures and things like that. If you have a talent, you can sing, you can dance, you can like do graphics for people. Like if you're the type of person that can design intros, outros, banners, like my friend that did mine, her name's Jess, check her out by the way then do things like that on the side to give you money. Like my friend Nick, he did my photos for my channel rebrand. Awesome job. That's a great example of ways to make money on the side. Like he's a full-time engineer, I believe, but on the side, he takes dope photos. I'm in Georgia. Here they have something called the Georgia Dream Program. And the Georgia Dream Program was an amazing opportunity. I always tell people about it, but it was a grant slash loan that pays down payment assistance. They have three types of loans. One is for like teachers and military where you would get 7,500 in closing costs. You can allocate the money there. One of them is a general $5,000 loan, which will allow you to move anywhere in the state of Georgia. You can pick the nicest county. You can pick the worst county. But if you're going to pick one of the worst counties, one of the harder hit counties, which is basically code for lots of foreclosures as determined by Georgia Dream, then you can get $15,000 in closing costs. And you do not have to pay this money back unless you decide to sell the house or refinance. I went with that option. It's a great option because it's not like you're going to be moving out soon. And I'm sure that like you aspire to grow in your career, you aspire to be better off five to eight years from now. I know that I do. And it's like, if my income continues to go up and my business that I desire to start starts and it's successful and my career, my nine to five is successful and I have all these other streams, eight years from now, if I want to sell my house and refinance, then I will be able to afford to do so. Know that you're gonna probably need at least three to 10 grand saved. And the reason why I say this is it really just depends about where you're located. Like if you're in California or another expensive state, then you may need a little more because the cost of living is more there. But if you're in the South, if you're in Georgia, or if you're just in a place where the apartments are not as expensive, like you can get a one bedroom for under a grand, then I'm gonna suggest that you save between three, on the low end, three, on the high end, $10,000. In the middle, somewhere between five and six. The reason why I say this is because you are gonna have to put up earnest money for the home when you put your offer. When I put my home up, I had to put up a grand. Now, in addition to that grand, I had to pay for an appraisal. That one was $550. I had to pay for an inspection. That one was $350. And then I actually had to pay for an inspection twice because I went under contract twice. The first house had so much crap wrong with it that I had to pull my offer. And I was out of that $350, but I got my $1,000 back. And I avoided buying a house that was just not in good condition for my family. So... I just named a couple things that I had to purchase and we're already almost at 3K. So that's why I'm telling you, you want to save at least 3K and then you're going to want a little bit more because once you get into the home, you're going to have to turn on your gas, your water, your electrical. You're going to have to turn on cable if you're going to get cable, your internet if you're going to have internet. You might have deposits that you have to pay and the deposit amounts are based on your credit score. If your credit is bad, you're gonna have to pay deposits to cut all this stuff on and put it in your name. So honestly, I'm gonna recant 3,000 and just say save up at least 5,000 to be on the safe side, but more is better. You know, That way you don't have to feel like you have to penny pinch when it's time for you to decorate your home and get some of the essentials. So it's a great opportunity for starter homes and I'm sharing that with you so that you can do your own research for your state and see what type of programs are available for you that do the same thing. The next thing I'm going to talk about is how much you need to save. 
How much you need to save is going to be very dependent on what type of home you want, what type of help you're going to have. You got to think long term with house buying. And that's why I say take your time, do your research and understand that it's an ongoing thing. Like if it's your house, it's meant to be something long term. So it doesn't have to be perfect within 30 days of you moving in. You don't have to be so excited about it that you're like buying all this stuff and oh, I can't wait for my house warming and I got to do this and I got to do that. Like, no, like take your time. You do not have to rush into the whole process. The great thing about these type of programs is that they typically require you to work on building your credit, learn about the whole home buying process, everything from, um, how to get pre-qualified, how to find a lender, how to pick your realtor, how to get a home inspection, what to look for when you go into these homes and not be fooled and bamboozled by these nice pictures on Trulia and Realtor.com and actually understand that you need to go and physically look at these properties and not get distracted by the new appliances and the bells and the whistles and look at stuff like the roofing and the electrical and the water, like hire somebody guys. But my point is that that opportunity not only gives you money to help you with closing, but it also gives you knowledge to prepare you to make a good decision. I do have other content about this. I will link some of those videos down below. Everything from when we bought our first home and closing day to things that I wish I would have known um, after a year being in the home. Recently, we touched down on two years in our home and there's been a lot of things that I've learned while living here. So I love to hear your thoughts. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comments and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye.